Mycroft, why is this business of interest to the government? Oh, my dear, it isn't. Not in the least. This is entirely unofficial. Really? And what's so special about this particular suicide and murder? The fact that the same victim was involved in both. It's about Master Harold, sir. I know why he did it. I know why he jumped off the lighthouse. Holmes! Get down! It's not safe! The Marlborough Point Mystery by Bert Cools with Clive Merrison as Sherlock Holmes and Andrew Sachs as Dr. John Watson, and featuring James Lawrenson as Mycroft Holmes. The Marlborough Point Mystery, Part 2. Holmes, Holmes, for God's sake, what were you thinking? All the stupid, ridiculous... What the devil, what's this? It's my coat. <gasps> Holmes! Were well, you really not sure? Oh, for the love of heaven, do you know what you did to me? Yes, I do, and I'm, I'm delighted. You are the most inhuman individual on the planet. Oh, Watson, it was necessary. Necessary? To test my theory to see if an overcoat, a crude dummy, and a yell into the wind could actually fool someone, which they did in spectacular fashion. You don't deny it? Oh, of course I don't deny it. I nearly died of shock. Look, look at this. It's just bits of old broken lobster pots tied together. Arms, legs, head. You see? Wicker work lobster pots, Watson. Dozens of them lying around the ruined huts. You see the implication? Huh? Well, the tide's turning. I suggest we get back across the causeway before we're marooned on this damn rock all day. Surely you're not still angry. And what the devil do you expect? Good Lord, I've put up with a lot over the years, but making me think you've killed yourself in front of my eyes, that's heartless, even for you. Uh, well, Watson, I'm sorry, but how else can I be sure? And the way you set it all up. You must take me for a fool. That ridiculous story, when I was a boy. That story is true. What, there really was an old house? Hmm. And I genuinely couldn't bear to be there for any length of time. And? and I went and did some research. The house was built on a reclaimed swamp. Marsh gas was filtering out through the foundations. Pure methane. Invisible and odourless, but more than enough to affect a ten-year-old boy. But you made me believe... Because that... you had to accept the possibility that I might jump. Look, look, I, I wish there could have been some other way. Hmm? But there wasn't. Watson? All right. Good man. Now, don't you ever do something like that again. You have my word, unless there's no alternative. Oh, you're impossible. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Now that you've done it, what does it prove? Well, it doesn't prove anything. Oh, for heaven's sake. It very, very strongly suggests that Harold Jefferson didn't jump from the lighthouse at all. What you're saying, he did exactly what you did? Put together a dummy? Hmm. Leaving the fragments of wicker that I found on the balcony and the scattered stones on the rocks. That's why he took two coats out with him that day. Not because he was mad, but because he was carrying out a very clever plan. But the boy was simple-minded. Could he really have come up with a scheme like that? Well, perhaps, or maybe he was just following instructions. So someone else could be involved? Someone else is involved. The killer. Whoever killed him also dreamed up the fake suicide? Why, for heaven's sake? Why, indeed. <sighs> um, there's something you don't know. There's rather a lot I don't know. That's not what I mean. Your wretched stunt drove it clean out of my mind. Ah, yes, your mission. Uh, did you succeed? Yes, I did. I'll tell you all about it over lunch. Excellent. And you can pay. So, what's the story? Why did Constable Powell dislike Harold Jefferson? It's to do with Powell's fiancé. The landlord at the pub told me you were going to be married. George never could keep his mouth shut. Surely it's not a secret. Congratulations. Thank you. 
When's the great day? Not fixed yet. Problems? Yes. Well, no, actually, not any... Look, I don't want to be rude, Doctor, but I'd rather not discuss it, if you don't mind. Not in the least. None of my business. <clears throat> These are excellent biscuits. A masterly piece of deflection. So, there had been an obstacle to the marriage, but now it doesn't exist. Hmm? Did you find out any more? Oh, yes, I did. There's a photograph on his mantelpiece. It's a young woman. It has to be his intended. Or a sister? No, it's not a sister. Well, how can you be so sure? Because I recognised her. Powell is engaged to Elizabeth Jefferson's housemaid. Is he indeed? Mm -hmm. And it was a big part of my duties looking after Master Harry. Exactly. And not only that, she was fond of him and she knew that he depended on her. So it's possible that she wouldn't have given up her job while he was still living at the house. And Powell would never have tolerated a wife who worked. Hence the resentment. Oh, splendid, Watson. Thank you. So, what now? <sighs> now we drink half or we'll be late for our appointment. <clears throat> And you know how touchy doctors can be. I tell you, I'm damnably unhappy about this whole business. Would you normally consider murder something to be happy about, Dr Scan? Don't be insulting. I mean the manner in which things are being handled. Orders straight from Whitehall, no official inquest, it's unheard of. I can't even call in the undertakers. And all because of a power-hungry exhibitionist who conducts himself in public with all the dignity of a circus clown. There is concern for his safety. Then let him stay away. The new lighthouse is functioning perfectly well. It doesn't need Sir Charles Steele breaking a bottle of champagne across its doorway or whatever it is he intends to do. Well, uh, do you want to look at the boy or not? There you are. I'll be back in my consulting room in the unlikely event that you require my assistance. Gentlemen. Oh, uh, Doctor. <sighs> Very good. Now. Oh, dear Lord. <sighs> if my theory is correct and he didn't jump from the lighthouse, then those head injuries weren't caused by hitting the rocks. They were deliberately inflicted to give that impression. Monstrous. Can you tell when the skull was damaged? Ah, uh, not from the wounds themselves. Perhaps something else. Yes. Yes, look at the hands. You see? It cuts on the palms. Mm -hmm. He tried to ward off the knife. If the head wounds had already happened, he would have been either dead or unconscious. Yes, and it's definite. It wasn't suicide. Uh, thank you. No. Anything else? Um, let me look at the chest. Mm. Well, that's more or less exactly what I was expecting. One thrust between the ribs and into the heart. Yeah. And bruising around the entry point. Mm, so the weapon was driven home with considerable force. Oh, now that is very interesting. What, the discoloration? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, help me turn him on his side. Right. Ah, that's the another wound, the wound in the back. That's different. No bruising and lower than the chest wound. This wouldn't have been fatal. No, it would have been more than enough to stop the boy if he was running from his killer. You think the knife might have been thrown? From far enough away not to penetrate to the hilt. It's, it's all in the dust on the floor of that hut. Then the murderer caught up with his victim, retrieved his weapon, spun the boy round and finished the job. And then staved in his skull. Mm. Oh, can you imagine someone coldly and calmly doing that? Yes, I can. We're dealing with an uncommon foe. Have you seen enough of the back? Uh, yes. Yeah, right, very good. Mm. <laughs> oh, oh, excellent. What is? Look. Well, there's material under his nail. Yes, now, let, let's, let's see if I can get a sample. If it's skin and blood, he might have marked his killer's face. Yes. Uh, oh. It's not skin and blood. It's something far more valuable. And you're not going to tell me what it is? What was it you remarked on the train yesterday? There's something to be said for the slow building up of suspense. Hmm? Come on, I have to send a telegram. Mm.
Excellent. Now, what would you like to do while we wait for a reply? I'd like to talk. Let's find somewhere quiet to sit. I have a theory. Hmm? Oh, go on. Suppose that someone wanted young Jefferson dead, or at least out of the way. We don't have to suppose it. We know it's true. It was a social encumbrance to his father and an obstacle to the constable, and to the maid if it comes to that. Elizabeth? What about her loyalty to the boy and her grief? Were well, neither emotions difficult to simulate? Well, I suppose not. But you needn't confine yourself to just those three. Hasn't it occurred to you that a brutal and inexplicable murder on his own land could be a considerable embarrassment to a rising young MP? Someone committed a murder just to tarnish Steele's reputation? Politics can be a vicious business. Yeah, but you were telling me your theory? Hmm? Hmm. Um, what if one of these people somehow persuaded the lad to jump from the lighthouse? We know he was simple-minded. Surely it would have had to have been positively moronic. Oh, if he was depressed enough or lonely enough, it might have been possible. Anyway, at the last minute, he decided not to do it, but to fake the jump instead. You said yourself that it could have been his own idea. And then the uh, someone found out. And used a knife to do the job properly? Well, you have to admit it fits the facts. Oh, yes, to a certain extent. But what about the money that was left in the father's house? I can't explain that. Can you? Yes, I can. I know who put it there and why. And I know that it was the direct cause of Harold Jefferson's murder. He was killed because of the money? I'll tell you something else. I suspect that the boy's death is nothing to do with what's actually going on here. Nothing at all. Ah, sir. Um, here you are. Just arrived. Ah, thank you. Ah. What is it? Another significant development. Oh. Huh. Another mystery for you to dangle in my face until you're ready to explain it. My friend, I promise you this. It will be worth the wait. Mm. Oh, hello. What? A happy coincidence. Just the man I wanted to see. Ah, good afternoon, Mr. Jefferson. Mr. Holmes. Doctor. When you've finished your business here, I'd appreciate a quiet talk. Somewhere private. Thank you, Elizabeth. We'll serve ourselves. Sir. Gentlemen. I'm sorry if I was short with you when you called this morning. A lot on my mind. No, of course. And a member of Sir Charles's private staff scrutinising your every move. A privilege. But also a responsibility. I am accustomed to responsibility. And you enjoy it? I won't deny it. Now, uh, sir, what is it you wish to tell me? Your son did not commit suicide. You're certain of that? I am. Doctor? Uh, the medical evidence is quite definite. Well, thank God. Thank God. I've examined the railings on that balcony. They're extremely unsafe. I don't believe that he intended to jump. So he can have a Christian burial. Mr. Holmes, you take a great weight from my mind. Yes, I rather thought I might. But the stabbing, what on earth does that mean? Constable Powell tells me that the area is sometimes used by smugglers bringing over contraband from France. I believe that your son staggered ashore, dazed and half drowned, and was unlucky enough to stumble on just such a gang. He was killed to silence him. By God! I'll track those men down if I have to call in every policeman in the county. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, I'm deeply in your debt. What did you think? You didn't believe a word of what you said to him. Of course I didn't. What matters is that he thinks I did. And this is a very small community. The story will spread. <laughs> hmm. And now... Yes? I fancy I'm ready for dinner. Mm, well, that was excellent. Food fresh from the land. Uh. Could you live in a place like this, Watson? And rusticate my life away? Not a chance. You... Why do you ask? Just out of interest. 
I know you don't want to discuss the case yet, but will you answer one question at least? That depends on what it is. Are we going to accept Jefferson's invitation to watch the final rehearsal tomorrow morning? Oh, my dear chap, I wouldn't miss it for the world. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. Good morning. Good morning. Constable Powell, excellent. The cast is assembling. Oh, Mr. Jefferson, you look worried. Mr. Lay has had to go back to London. Oh, is that a problem? No, I suppose not, but he was to have stood in for Sir Charles in the run-through. Mr. Holmes, I don't suppose you'll care. Oh, I don't know. I'd be delighted, but I don't think it's going to be necessary. What do you mean? Simply that there's an even better candidate available. Look. Well, I, I can't... Oh, good Lord. Well, not quite, but no doubt he'd tell you that it's only a matter of time. Good morning to you, Sir Charles. Mr. Holmes, a pleasure. Doctor... And you must be the excellent Jefferson. Mr. Charles, a great honour. Just thought I'd take a look, see how things are going. Anything I can do to help? Oh, my dear sir. Good oh. Mr. Holmes, don't rush away afterwards. I'd appreciate a word. <laughs> I hear you've solved the case. The boy's fall was an accident and he was killed by smugglers? That is my opinion, yes. And so I'm in no personal danger. There's no mindless maniac at large here. No, there certainly is not. Well, that's excellent. I'm grateful to you. I'll tell my brother that all his precautions were unnecessary and the investigation will be handed over to the local police. Young Powell will appreciate that. Good. Very good. Mm. Shall I see you at the ceremony tomorrow? Alas, the doctor and I are returning home today. Well, I'm pleased to have met you both. Mr. Holmes? Sir Charles. When we get to London, I have to see Mycroft. Oh. What do you want me to do? I'll go to Baker Street and while away a few hours. Then pick up your thickest gloves, a good, warm scarf, a dark lantern and your revolver. We're going back. We're going back. This place is unearthly at night. Yes, it's a worthy setting. Now, I suggest we take up our position. Where, Mr. Holmes? Inside the old lighthouse. Doctor, do you know exactly what's going on? Mr. Holmes didn't explain. He just told me to expect you two tonight and have the carriage waiting. So, well, something big. Ah, I was right. It's not here yet. It? We should conceal ourselves. I suggest the stairs just below the next level. Yes, this will do admirably. Clear view of the door. And now we wait. If I'm correct, and I am, it shouldn't be for too long. It was the tide that gave me my first clue. The tide? Mm. And the time of the ceremony tomorrow morning. Huh? Highly suggested. But what has that to do with young Harry Jefferson? Watson. Nothing. His death isn't connected to the real case at all. Then what is the real case? Quiet. I can't hear a thing. Silence. Good evening, Sir Charles. What the devil? Thank you for not keeping us waiting for too long. What's the meaning of this? You boy. Powell, isn't it? What's going on? Well, so... An excellent question. Perhaps you'd care to supply the answer yourself. No? This is outrageous. I'm leaving. And not just yet, if you wouldn't mind. Doctor! How dare you threaten me, sir? 
Lower your gun at once. I think not. Constable Powell takes Sir Charles into custody. You want me to arrest him? But what's the charge? The charge is high treason. Good God. Good evening, Sherlock. Doctor. Well, Constable, I repeat, the charge is high treason. But, sir, I mean, who are you? I, sir, am the British government. Now, do your duty. Go on there. <coughs> Up you get. Kindly do not manhandle me! I had to have this business handled as discreetly as possible. So you came yourself? Well, surely we could have managed things. Well, of course, Doctor. But as my brother is just about to explain to you, tonight's events are far from over. Sherlock, shouldn't you be getting back? Ah, uh, yes, we should. You'll send the carriage back out for us. Of course. Happy hunting, brother. Holmes, just who are we after now? <laughs> Come on, Watson. It's almost time for the big finish. Holmes. Shh, shh, shh. I'm listening. Good. Not yet. It was the one weak link in my plans if it already arrived. Someone's coming here to meet Sir Charles? Exactly. So we're in for another vigil, I'm afraid. Back to the stairs, is it? No, I think we'll wait down here this time. Nothing like a spot of variety. <laughs> Ooh, variety. <laughs> Come on, and your best whisper, if you would. I don't know which was the bigger shock. You're telling me that Sir Charles was a traitor, or your brother appearing in that doorway. I had no idea that Mycroft had followed us down from London. As you say, it's not exactly in character. It does give you the measure of the situation. I told you he didn't tell us the full story. How long had you known about Sir Charles? Not long. I still don't know the details. It's possible I never shall. Well, surely there'll be a trial. I think you'll find there are less public ways of handling such matters. Oh, but that's appalling. Well, I can tell you this much. Steele knew that his activities were suspected. How do you know that? Well, why else was he planning to disappear? <sighs> and you accuse me of telling stories backwards. I thought you'd have seen it by now. Indulge me. That's what this whole affair has been leading up to. He was planning to fake his own death and start a new life, almost certainly abroad. Good Lord. At the ceremony tomorrow morning? Exactly. You've got it. It would have been quite a scene. A huge crowd, the gentlemen of the press. But where is the guest of honor? Consternation. And somebody spots him. On the balcony of the old disused lighthouse. And before their horrified gaze, he flings himself off. And his body is swept out to sea, another victim of the mysterious maze. In reality, of course, he waits in here until he can get away unobserved. That's why the ceremony had to be at high tide, to make sure the evidence would be taken away by the currents. Then the boy, the Harry Jefferson... Was a trial run, a rehearsal, which ended in his death. By God, that's callous. So Steele's a murderer, too. No, 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 no. The scheme wasn't his. He doesn't have that sort of mind. He had an advisor. And that's who we're waiting for now? Yes, yes. He'll be bringing the wicker work dummy for Sir Charles to use. That's what I was looking for earlier. They couldn't risk arriving together. Oh, no, no. Too dangerous. What sort of man can come up with a scheme like that? Well, you tell me. Oh, devious, calculating, devoted to detail. Jefferson. Quiet. He's here. Sir Charles? Sir Charles? Well, come on, you can speak. It's safe. There's no one for miles. That's not entirely true, I'm afraid. What's that? Who's that? Oh, my, uh, my apologies. Let's add our lantern light to yours. Watson. Here. Watson? Uh, as in Dr. Watson? The same. So, good grief, are you Sherlock Holmes? Bravo! 
very convincing, one of your finest performances. Watson, meet the elusive Mr. Laid, personal advisor to Sir Charles Steele and the mastermind behind this entire affair. Allow me to relieve you of that. Hmm? Ah, not as good as mine. <laughs> this is nonsense. You know, I really do congratulate you. This whole business was planned in the tiniest, most intricate detail, and it very nearly worked exactly as it was supposed to, smoothly and flawlessly, like a well-tuned machine. You sound as if you admire him. Well, not his aim or his methods. I admire his skill. I admired him last time we met, too. Huh? You know this man? And so do you. I've never seen him before. There you are, then. Another tribute. It really, it really is an excellent disguise. Now, personally, I'd have used a rather thinner beard and a, yes, perhaps a lighter shade for the skin colour. But the, the wig, the wig, that's very fine. And so is the voice. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't see where this is going. Well, then, allow me to demonstrate. No resistance, good, very, very sensible. Now, first, the beard and the wig and the spectacles. Et voilà. You. In person, all this week. Good evening to you, Doctor. There. Very good. Extremely comfortable. What? Mr. Holmes, just who is this man? Constable, allow me to introduce you to a music hall artist, actor, master of disguise, criminal genius and multiple murderer. Mr. Frederick Meridew. Hmm. Can't say I've ever heard of him. Ignorant fool. I assure you the loss is yours. Annoyed, Meridew? <laughs> Fame is a fickle thing. You're not in London now. <laughs> I play the entire country. Not for much longer, I fancy. In any case, we're a long way from the nearest music hall. False hair and makeup in case somebody recognised you. Totally unnecessary. I fancy the same could be said of some of your own disguises. Hardly. Oh, I think so. So you two know each other well? <laughs> yes. Yes. They've crossed swords once before. And I emerged triumphant. You deny it. Of course I deny it, Mr. Holmes. Let's suppose that someone did plan a murder on exactly those lines. Someone intelligent, resourceful and cunning. Don't you imagine that he would take pains to check every detail in advance? By, for example, consulting a doctor on exactly what might happen to a man's hand at the point of sudden death. And if he did, I believe he would learn that cadaveric spasm... That is the correct term, Doctor. Yes, it is. That cadaveric spasm does indeed occur, but not by any means in every single case. They're so important, these little exceptions in life, don't you agree? Heaven knows, gentlemen, I'm no expert, but I believe the relevant phrase is reasonable doubt. Thank you for a most entertaining conversation. Is that really what happened? Mr. Meridew's memory is excellent. That's true. I remember it so well. Not being arrested, not going to court. And getting away with murder. Oh, did I? You'll not escape me this time, Meridew. I can put together every single link in the chain. I've been following your career with great interest. I'm flattered. The first tentative steps, offering your services as a consultant to the underworld, the, the escalation of the crimes, the growing fame in criminal circles, the higher stakes, the more and more illustrious clients. My dear Mr. Holmes, it sounds as if I was merely following your excellent example. So you admit it? By no means. Just joining in your little game. This is no game, Meridew. Oh, some people simply have no lightness in them at all. Don't you ever get tired of it, Doctor, being the upright, moral gentleman every second of every day? I'm supposed to have a sense of romanticism, a vivid imagination. Don't you ever apply it to yourself? Don't you ever want something different? Don't you ever want to fly? Holmes, let's get this over with. The air in here is foul. This went on until finally you were approached by Sir Charles Steele. Didn't it bother you in the least that you were working for a traitor to the realm? What is it you once said, Mr. Holmes? A client to me is a mere unit, a factor in a problem. A sentiment worthy of, well, of myself. And it was quite an intriguing one, his particular problem. You saw the lighthouse ceremony as the perfect opportunity. 
You came down here, insinuated yourself with Jefferson. That was no challenge. And then you persuaded his son that he could have the new life he longed for. All he had to do was bring an end to his old one by seeming to kill himself. Death cancels all obligations. You exploited his trust and his simplicity for your own twisted purpose. An atrocious act. Nonsense. The boy was every bit as behind bars as I am right now. He deserved to be set free. He didn't deserve to die. <laughs> that was his own fault. He didn't stick to the script. Mr. Lade! Mr. Lade! I'm here. Mr. Lade, it worked! Just like you said it would. Where did you go? I've been waiting. I've been home. Home? What do you mean you've been home? There was something I had to do. Something important. Well, why don't you tell me all about it? I believe you'd given him some money as an earnest of good faith. And to start him in a new life in London. You seriously intended to help him achieve that? And why wouldn't I? I'm not a monster. I probably felt sorry for him. Until you discovered that he'd left the money for his father to find. Oh, is that what he did? I think something else happened too that night. Or didn't happen. You didn't leave the note. I forgot, sorry. Can we go to London now? Yes, yes. Of course we can. You come with me. In you go. Here, take the lantern. Right. Why are we here? You'll see in a minute. Good. Mr. Lade? Mr. Jefferson? Thank you ever so much. This is the nicest thing anyone's ever done for me. You snivelling idiot. What? You pathetic, stupid, irresponsible little moron. I'm not. Don't call me that. Weeks of preparation, a plan of genius. And what do I hear? I forgot. Uh, but I did. What's that? It's called a knife. Quieter and less bulky than a gun, but every bit as efficient. You made a mistake, Meridew. You let your emotion get the better of you, and you made a mistake. Not in killing the boy. Careful, Holmes. You're shocking the good doctor. Not even in mutilating the corpse. Which presumably I did for insurance. Just one more puzzle in case it was ever found. But in killing him there and leaving him there where the body could so easily be discovered. Easily? In the middle of that godforsaken wilderness? That wasn't a mistake. That was inspired. It's hardly my fault that a chance in a million occurred. Who did find it anyway? I've been wondering about that. Well, you can keep on wondering. It will give you something to occupy your thoughts while you're waiting for the hangman. Oh, now that really is a trifle presumptuous, don't you think? Meridue, I'm tired of this. Well, well. Now who's letting their emotions run away with them? Where's your proof, Mr. Holmes? Your incontrovertible proof? I can place you in the hut. Your movements there are written as legibly as a newspaper headline. I know where you were when you struggled and the boy knocked you down. I know where he fell when you knifed him in the back. I know where you stood when you threw away the bloody stone you used to cave in his skull. Traces in the dust. You planning to produce them in court? I plan to have them photographed and shown to the jury. Who will see that someone was in the hut, that someone fought with the boy, that someone knifed him to death. Someone who could have been anyone. Yes, that's quite true. Holmes? Oh, my dear sir, what a waste of both our times. It's the Turner case all over again. No, sir, it is not. No? Because I'll show the jury something else, too. The fragments of your false beard, the crystals of dried spirit gum, and the smears of your skin makeup that I took from under the dead boy's fingernails. Chemical analysis will match them beyond any doubt, and I'll tell them about the journey of the evidence mirror to you. The journey provided by the struggle from your face to his hands, from his hands to yours, and from yours to the skin of his chest, where you braced yourself against his lifeless body to pull out the knife. I can put you and no one else in that hut, as surely and securely as if I'd seen you there with my own two eyes, and all thanks to your disguise, the disguise you thought was so necessary, but that you didn't need at all. It's your vanity that's going to hang you, Meridue. 
your vanity and your arrogance. Pure science, applied to detection, your own innovation, I believe. You are quite correct, Mr. Holmes, you called me a genius. Allow me most sincerely to return the compliment. Mr. Meridue, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Holmes. Good morning, Mrs. Chang. You have news. Yes. The boy's killer will be brought to justice. That is pleasing. Oh, one moment. Good, Pang Yao. Clever, Pang Yao. Here. Remarkable. How did you know I had taught him to do that? The early training involves fitting a ring to the neck so the bird can't swallow any large catches. Once it's learned what it has to do, the ring can be removed. Only in the most intelligent of creatures. And the marks where the ring was fitted are still just visible, if one knows where to look. Very impressive. Elementary. Oh, I do not think so. And neither, I suspect, do you. Perhaps not. Thank you for telling me your news. I'm pleased that you succeeded. Yes, so am I. Cheshire Sayin, Miss Jack. Buka Chi, Mr. Holmes. Remember my words. The wise man does not deny his one true path. Thank you. Uh, brother? Brother? Mm. I still don't see why we couldn't have met at the Diogenes Club. They have a rather better cellar. Mycroft, only you could turn up out of the blue at the most isolated spot in the entire southeast at two o'clock in the morning and yet still object to making a ten-minute cab journey. He's annoyed with me, Doctor, because I didn't tell him everything right at the start of the case. And you found that irritating, Holmes? Really? Just how much did you know when you sent for me? Oh, well, we'd known for some time about Steele's... Uh activities, and we'd been looking into anything unusual that happened around him. The Malvern Point business was simply the latest instance. And I, I'd no idea that it was tied up with the plan for him to disappear un uh, until you deduced it. Well, if it was nothing special, why did you use me? Why not one of your own people? I told you. I knew that you were bored. And obviously I didn't want to spoil your enjoyment by giving you too much information. Obviously. Don't be sarcastic, Sherlock. It's extremely undignified. <laughs> I must go. Oh, one last thing. If your attitude to the honours list has changed since the last time I inquired... It hasn't. <laughs> Stubborn as ever. Oh, well. Good evening, brother. Good evening. I'll see myself out. Doctor? Oh, Mr Holmes. I wish you joy of him. Thank you. Oh. Uh, yes. Oh. It's been an interesting case. Rewarding, too. Oh, yes. And to think it's all thanks to a trained cormorant. Hmm. If that bird hadn't found the body, the whole business might never have come to light. God only knows what damage Steele could have done to the country. A dumb creature saves the state, unique in the annals of crime. Oh, that's wonderful. Um... Uh, you know... There wouldn't be just one thing that you don't understand still? Actually, it's two things. Doubtless my lack of imagination. Oh, I hope you didn't take that to heart. No, of course not. Good. What are they, the two things? Your telegram. To the manager of the majestic chain of music halls, Meridy was due to perform in his houses this week and last. You asked if he appeared. And was told that he broke his contract and never turned up. I'm not conclusive, but highly suggestive. Second thing. Um, the money. Why did Harold Jefferson leave the money for his father? Well, you remember the man's words to us. 
I gave the boy a home when I could have put him in an institution. I put clothes on his back, a roof over his head, and food in his stomach, and this is the thanks I get. Do you doubt that he said exactly the same thing to the boy himself? Hmm? Time after time. His son was repaying his debt. Yeah, a handsome, generous act, however misjudged. The act of the gentleman his father thought he could never become. Oh, if only he'd been shown just a shred of affection. And the whole business would never have happened. <laughs> Behold how destinies can change and lives be shaped by the lack of a kindly word. <sighs> uh, would you mind? Oh, not in the least. Thank you. You played that for me just a few days after we first moved in here. Did I? I didn't have the least idea what to make of you. Have you now? Oh, I think so, yes. Maybe. You know, I love these moments. The case is solved, everything's over, we're back here in the warmth and comfort. Until the next client comes along. <laughs> and then off we'll go again. I wish it could always be like this. Watson. It will. How can it? Nothing lasts forever. It will because of you. Because of your stories. Don't you see? It doesn't matter what happens here in the real world. We're more than reality, you and I. You, my friend, have made us immortal. That's quite a thought. It's the truth. As long as there are mysteries and murders... And fog and fear... And terror and injustice... Then Sherlock Holmes, private consulting detective... And John H. Watson, chronicler, comrade and friend... Will be ready... Waiting for the dramatic ring at the doorbell. <laughs> 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 the, the game's, game's afoot! In The Malvern Point Mystery, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Medicine and Dr. John Watson by Andrew Sachs. Frederick Meridue was played by Richard Delane and Mycroft Holmes by James Lawrenson. Constable Powell was played by Piers Wainer. Sir Charles Steele by Nigel Hastings, Mrs. Chang by Pixen Lim, Harold Jefferson by Joseph Cohen Cole, Mr. Jefferson by Bruce Alexander, Dr. Scanlon by John Biggins, Elizabeth by Tessa Nicholson, and the Postmaster by Bert Cools. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The violinists were Leonard Friedman and Ian Humphreys. The Malvern Point Mystery was written by Bert Cools from a reference in the short story The Veiled Lodger by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The director was Patrick Rayner.